Hello everyone, my name is Lucas Barreto Santana. I am a PhD student here at the Federal University of Sergipe, Brazil. Uh, today I prepared this oral presentation for the ICDIM 2020. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the main topic of my work, which is called Application of Density Functional Theory, or DFT, to the study of luminescence effects in magnesium tetraborate crystals. Uh, I work with a very brave and competent group of researchers, uh, composed by Professor Francesco De Rico, Professor Susana Souza, Dr. Giordano Bispo, Professor Mario Valerio, Dr. Tarsila de Oliveira, and Professor and also my advisor, Milan Lalish. So these are the outlines of my presentation. I will try to explain uh, very briefly all the theoretical framework uh, because I want to make sure that you all have the right basis to understand the results of my calculations. Right now I'm working with the uh, magnesium tetraborate uh, doped with cerium in the side of the magnesium and is still an uh, ongoing work, so I will present some partial results that we obtain uh, in this work that we are performing. So we will start talking a bit about the many-body problem, okay? Uh, the many-body problem is a classical problem in physics. In the past, uh, uh, researchers used to use the classic physics to try to describe this kind of problem. Uh, in our case, we have to remember that we are working with crystals, and crystals are very uh, complex uh, materials. They are composed by a large number of entities. Uh, as you can see here, we have to describe all the positions of these entities inside these crystals. So if we want to do a realistic description of these kinds of systems, we have to use uh, the quantum mechanics. So we have the spatial wave function for our crystal. All these little r's right here represents the position of the electrons, and the capitalized r's are the positions of the nuclei. So as you can see, we have a large number of uh, uh, entities to describe this kind of system. So it's not a simple system. Also, if, you, if we want to obtain information from this kind of system, we have to use this operator, this quantum operator, which is called non-relativistic complete Hamiltonian. Uh, as you can see, is kind of a big uh, formula, but I'll try to break it up to you, explain each part of this formula. The first one is the kinetic energy of the nu nuclei. As you can see, we have uh, this operator right here that operates into the, uh, uh, into the nuclei coordinates. The second part is the kinetic energy of electrons. Uh, this operator here operates into the uh, electronic coordinations. The third one is the Coulomb interaction between electrons. The fourth one is the Coulomb interaction between nuclei. And the last one is the Coulomb interactions between electrons and nuclei. So we have to take into account all the contributions and all the interactions that happen inside this complex uh, crystalline environment. And as you can see, it's a very challenging problem to solve. So what we have to do is to use some intelligent approximations to try to transform our problem into a most treatable one. The first approximation that we do is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which was proposed by Max Born and Oppenheimer in 1944. Um, as you can see in this image right here, we have a clear difference uh, in the wave function of the electrons when we compare with the wave function of the nuclei. Based on the fact that the nuclei are thousands of times heavier than the electrons, Born and Oppenheimer uh, realized that the uh, wave equations of the electrons are much more delocalized when we compare with the nuclear uh, wave functions. Uh, if we, we can think into a, in a practical example, for instance, imagine a cow in a field surrounded by flies. 
If we compare the movement of the flies with the movement of the cow, we can say that the cow is practically at rest, is not moving at all. So this is kind of what happens in the systems that we study with this kind of theory. So what Bernie and Oppenheimer uh, realized is that we can make an approximation and say that the uh, nuclear coordinations can be considered parameters, can be fixed. And in this way, we will transform our original problem into a multi-electronic system under external potential resulting from the static configuration of the nuclei. As you can see here, we transform the, uh, the group of uh, nuclear coordinations into a group of parameters, and then we will have uh, an electronic wave function and a nuclear wave function. And our problem basically is to solve only the electronic wave function and the information that the nuclei give us uh, to the system. It will be this kind of background potential that we will discuss in the next slides. Uh, to work with this kind of theory, we also have to choose a smart uh, set of bases. In that case, we are familiar with the LAPW bases, which means Linear Augmented Plane Waves. Uh, what we do here is consider that inside of our crystalline environment, as you can see in the scheme right here, we have the, uh, the scheme of the effective potential in uh, sodium crystal. Uh, we have two very distinct regions when we want to talk about potential, okay? We have this green line right here that represents the potential in the interstitial zone, uh, which means uh, in the zone where we don't have uh, the nuclei. And we have this more, much more dramatic potential in the regions where we have the nuclei localized. So what we do here is choose a set of bases uh, and this means basically two bases, a planar wave basis to represent the problem in the interstitial region, and a radio uh, wave basis, uh, atomic basis, to represent the problem in, in the, the places where we have a potential that behaves much more drastically. As you can see here, uh, into in this image we have this scheme once again described so this yellow zone right here is the interstitial region uh, and the spheres the red spheres and also the blue spheres are the regions with the nuclei of our uh, crystalline motif um, so we use plane waves in the interstitial zone and we use the atomic-like functions into inside the spheres. And what defines these spheres is this radius right here that we call muffin tin sphere. Uh, is the radio that define uh, where we have these atomic-like functions. Of course, we have to guarantee the continuity of these two kinds of functions in, in the limits of these two regions. Uh, one advantage of the LAPW method over pseudo potential base methods is that core and sim core electrons are explicitly included in the calculation. So we will have a more realistic description of our problem. Uh, and then we have the proposition of the density function of theory that I'll try to speak very quickly about it. It was uh, constructed by the work of these three great uh, scientists, uh, Hohenberg, Kohn, and Chan. Kohn received a Nobel Prize by its contributions to this area. Uh, what they realized is that instead of using that spatial wave function, which has a big dependence into this large number of quantities, we can use a much more treatable one, which is the electronic density, because in the electronic density, we only have the dependence of one uh, one set of coordinations. Uh, in that case, if it's three-dimensional, it's three, three, uh, three values. Uh, so they realize that if we use the density, we will have a much more faster problem to solve. 
Uh, and by doing that, we can also uh, write the energy of the system as a function of the density. We can also write this density as a function of the Konenshan orbitals, which are this kind of uh, artificial orbitals to represent the problem that is mapped into this much more easier problem to solve. And by doing that, we can do a functional minimization, uh, taking into account the minimization of the energy in function of the density. By doing that, we can write the energy of our system. Here we call this energy of Konenshan energy. So we can write the total energy of our system in function of the density. And doing the minimization of this energy in function of the density, we will find the more probable configuration. The only part in this equation that have to be used uh, considering experimental reports and experimental data is the part of the exchange in correlation energy, okay? Uh, this part, it, uh, it appears from the fact that we are working with uh, quantum particles that moves inside, inside of our crystal and we have these two eff effects that have to be taken into account to uh, obtain the most realistic treatment, treatment of our problem. Uh, so basic, what we do here is to get a very difficult problem to solve with Schrodinger theory because we have a large number of electrons that interacts with each, with each other and they also suffer the, the influence of an external potential. So what we do here is to transform this problem into a formally equivalent one which is much more easier to solve with DFT because right now we have what we call Konenshan particles, which are non-interacting. And all this interaction that we have here into the classical problem, it will be inserted into the effective potential. Uh, and by doing that with the Konenshan equations, we can obtain the system properties that we are interested to obtain. Uh, once again, we have the description of the, poten the effective potential. Uh, as you can see, once again, we have uh, this uh, part right here, which is, which is the energy of exchange and correlation. Uh, we have different uh, ways to represent the, this factor in, in the equations. It will depend basically in the nature of the material that we are working. So we have LDA, we have GGA, we have also MBJ. And each one of these choices of uh, exchange and correlation potential uh, have to be made with a lot of uh, attention because each one is interest for, for specific materials and also sometimes are, are different for specific properties that you want to obtain from that system. For, for instance, if we are interested in to electronic properties, we have to use the MBJ. Uh, exchange and correlation potential. Uh, so basically the DFT is a ab initio method, uh, a full potential method uh, with the basis of LAPW. In our work we, we implemented the DFT with the VN2K code uh, and also we have a large uh, literature that proves a good agreement of calculated properties with experimental reports. So uh, this is the motive that we choose this kind of theory to attack this problem. Before talking about the calculations and partial results, I want to speak very quickly about the uh, flow chart of the DFT calculation strategy. Basically, what we do first is to gather information about the structure that we are about to study. In that case, we rely on uh, experimental and also theoretical studies. After that, we mount our simulation with all the parameters, spatial group, information about the symmetry that we get from this gathering of information, and then we perform the minimization calculations. After that, we obtain the electronic, structural, and optic data. 
and then we compare this these results with the literature. If we have a good agreement, we add the defects in the simulation. This is a very important part in our study because we are interested to study materials with thermoluminescent properties. And we know that the defects plays an important role in the thermoluminescence uh, mechanism. Uh, after that, we do the minimization in the presence of the defect, and then we obtain all the properties from the defect configuration. Uh, the MBO compound, or magnesium tetraboride compound, doped with cerium in the city of Magnesio, uh, was developed by Prokic in 1980. Uh, it made the first detector of MBO doped with rare earth elements. Uh, it's a very important material because it has a very good effective atomic number, which is 8.4, which makes a very good uh, tissue equivalent material. However, we have a lack of profound knowledge about the band gap and electronic structure of these kinds of material. That's one of the motives for us to study these kinds of material because we want to explain and discover all the uh, details about the luminescent mechanism that happens in the MBO, also because it's something that it hasn't been done yet. Uh, we also know that we can uh, uh, research improvements with doping techniques also, the lithium-6 or the boron-10 have nuclei capable of converting incident neutron radiation into charged particles. Then, if we use these two atoms as co-dopants in our matrix, we can also have a dosimeter that we will be able to detect neutronic radiation. And we use theoretical methods to solve incorporation sites and analyze the influence of the impurities in the properties of the MBO. So the first case is the undoped case of the MBO, which have a orthorhombic structure of 96 atoms. We have symmetry operations. The symmetry group is the D2H. Uh, we have groups of borite bounded to 3 magnesium 2+. So we have four possible sites to incorporate our defect. We have the magnesium site and we have the three different boroughs. Uh, as a first assumption, we choose the magnesium site because it's bigger and also because of the charge compensation. It has a much more stable uh, configuration uh, uh, when we think theoretically if the cerium goes into this site. Uh, so let's talk first about the undoped case, okay? Uh, the first thing is was to gather information about the experimental data about this compound, the MBO, as you can see right here. And then we mount our simulation and do the minimizations calculations. As you can see, if we choose the LDA as a, a exchange and correlation and potential, we will have a very... Uh, good agreement between the experimental and our simulation, as you can see it right here. This indicates that we are starting in a good uh, way to study this kind of material because it, it indicates that our simulations make sense and probably will have good results. After that, we can also obtain the density of states of our pure material. Uh, as you can see, we have our valence band and our conduction band. We can also characterize each one of these bands. You can see the contribution of the magnesium and the boron and oxygen in, in these bands. Also, we can characterize the orbitals that are present in each one of these atoms. As you can see right here, the boron contributes very uh, good with the S and P orbital. Uh, the band structure of the MBO is also one of the results obtained with this kind of study. Uh, here we have the representation of the first transition. As you can see, it happens in the same crystallographic position, gamma. Uh, this indicates that we have a direct band gap of approximately 9 electron volts, which uh, exactly is the value that we obtain, which it is 9.58 electron volts. Until now, we don't have experimental report about this kind of material. 
It's one of the, the things that our group is working to obtain it, so we will be able to compare with this result. But we have uh, experimental data from similar materials, such which uh, lithium tetraborate, which has a band gap of 8.8 .8 to 9.8 electron volts, and also lithium B305, which has a band gap of 9.5 electron volts. So these are good leads that we are on the right way. Um, also, we can obtain the optical properties, the optical absorption of our material. Right here, we can see uh, the transitions between the orbitals that we saw there in the, into, from the valence band to the conduction band and how these transitions contributes to its optical absorption right here. This is a very important result when we are trying to develop uh, dosimeters uh, that will be readed from uh, mechanisms of luminescent because we want to make sure to choose the appropriate range of uh, wavelength to detect the most uh, quantity of signal when we read these dosimeters. And then we go to the case where we put the cerium in the side of magnesium right here, the green sphere. In that case, we lose all the symmetry. We have now 96 crystallographic different atoms, which is a headache because it makes a much more difficult problem to solve. And by difficult, I mean a heavier and we have to spend a lot of time and computational uh, resource to solve it. Uh, first, we had to loosen up this setup to get a workable calculation. But right now we are working in collaboration with the University of Pisa, which arranged a very good supercomputer to perform these calculations, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, by the way, I want to thank Professor De Rico but for that. Uh, in the simulation, we use the same lattice parameters from the undoped case. As you can see right here, once again, we can obtain the density of states, and we have a very interesting result. Uh, the cerium insert its uh, states in the band gap, in the prohibited zone, which was something that we expect, but now we have some kind of proof that this is happening. Uh, the cerium inserts itself in the band gap, creating these states that will be useful to capture the electrons for the thermoluminescence process. Uh, we can also characterize uh, the orbitals of this serion. In that case, we have the orbitals D and F that contributes to these states. It's something that we already expected as well because we are treating with lanthanides and we know that these kinds of orbitals, they insert itself on the matrix in very defined places because they are very well bounded from the rest of the atomic environment. And this is a very interesting result. We are trying to improve our simulation. So I want to conclude my presentation saying that DFT is a very sophisticated and well-established theory to study the luminescence processes. Uh, we obtain good results for the lattice parameters and band gap values estimated by the experimental studies. Uh, the density of states and optical absorption spectra for the MBO and the MBO doped with cerium were calculated. We intend to do more simulations with different sites for the incorporation of the defect in the MBO. In that case, we want to do calculations with the uh, BORU sites. In fact, is the calculation that I'm working right now. Uh, there is a very good indication that Boro is a very favorable site. We have the study of Dr. Giordano Bispo, and he found out that the site of Boro is favorable for the incorporation of the defect. You can check this out in the presentation number 112. And we intend to do calculations with different lanthanized defects also, doping and co-doping our crystal. These results will be compared with the experimental da data researched by our collaborators all around the world. I want to finish my presentation thanking all my collaborators and also thanking everyone for watching me today. I hope you are all safe, uh, respecting the quarantine and also keeping your beliefs in science. Bye bye.